This podcast covers uh, the book of Revelation, although um, the book of Revelation uh, is so complex that this could be a study of many, many years and thousands and thousands of pages. So all I'm going to do is give you the very briefest of introductions. First of all, some background. Uh, a lot of people have said a lot of crazy things about the book of Revelation, and that's because they don't understand the background. Context is everything, remember? So here's a look at the historical context, first of all. The book was written by the Apostle John, one of Jesus' original disciples. It was probably written around 90 or 95 AD, just before John's death, uh, where he was in exile on the island of Patmos, where the Roman authorities had put him as punishment for his role in preaching Christianity. At this time, there was a significant persecution of Christians, not only by Romans, but also by Jews. The Jews hated the Christians because they saw them as heretics and uh, apostates. And the Romans hated Christians uh, partly because the emperor, Nero, used them as a scapegoat to blame everything that was wrong uh, in the Roman Empire on the Christians, to kind of the way Hitler used the Jews as a scapegoat to blame everything that was wrong in Germany on the Jews. Uh, so at this time, Christians were being arrested and imprisoned and martyred, burned at the stake, thrown to the lions, and all those kinds of ugly things. As a result, the book of Revelation was written in a kind of code so that it would be understandable to Christians, but it would not be understandable to Romans or Jews. And so a lot of the stuff that's in here is uh, symbolic and uh, only will be understood by people who a, understand the Old Testament, and B, understand the unique role that Jesus plays in the Bible. Some of the themes that come up over and over again in the book of Revelation are these. First of all, Jesus is Lord. Now, this is the most basic theme of all. Jesus is Lord. He's Lord of heaven. He's Lord of earth. He is Lord over the Romans. He's Lord over the Jews. They just don't know it. He is Lord everywhere, and he is specifically the Lord of the Christian. And he is Lord of the individual Christian's life. He is Lord of what they eat and what they drink and how they spend their money and how they behave. Um, the Lordship of Jesus was taken very seriously by these early Christians, as it should be taken very seriously by Christians today. In fact, the earliest confession of what it means to be a Christian was simply these three words, Jesus is Lord. Another theme in the book of Revelation is that things are bad now, but don't cheer up because they're going to get much, much worse. Um, the persecution is going to increase. It's going to become so bad that it will be in doubt as to whether any, any of God's people will actually survive. So just in the same way that Jesus was tortured to death, so many Christians will be tortured to death, and it will look like the whole Christian faith is going to be stamped out. But uh, even though you may think that God has abandoned you, and that the whole Christian story is a hoax and a farce and a failure, don't be discouraged. Don't give up. Because the reality is that Jesus is Lord, and he will overcome. And even though it looks like that's not true, it is true. And in the darkest hour, the sun will rise, and everything will be okay. So just stay faithful to Jesus, no matter what they do to you. Stay faithful. Some of the further themes in the book uh, have to do with uh, the interplay of Christianity with the world around it. And one of the statements ha is that political powers are not to be trusted. Um, people are inherently selfish. They are inherently vicious and evil. Uh, it is true, as Lord Anson said, that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So the more power you put into the hands of human beings, the more evil they will do with it. So don't trust political powers. Also, don't trust religious powers, because even religious power corrupts people. So people who are the heads of any religion will tend to be self-interested and concerned only about their own good, and they will tend to abuse the very people that they're supposed to be taking care of and looking out for. And uh, the religion itself will become a kind of a monster, kind of a beast, just like the political power. So you see in, in the book of Revelation a number of beasts representing political powers and religious powers and how they grind and tear and devour the people who are trying to be faithful to the Lord. 
when religious and political powers combine together, then they're really bad. Um, in the Roman Empire, uh, the Caesar, the emperor, was also revered as a deity. And um, so you had to not only obey the political power because it was the political power, but you also had to worship Caesar and obey him because he was Lord. Well, Christians said, uh-uh, Caesar's not Lord, Jesus is Lord. And that's part of the reason, of course, why they got into so much trouble. But uh, back in those days, there was no separation between the powers of the state and the powers of religion. In our society, we have constitutional protections that say the state cannot use religion and religion cannot use the state. These are two separate realms. So when politics exercises its power, it can't say, well, we're going to use our power to enforce some particular religion and make everybody worship on a certain day or in a certain way. And religious powers can't appeal to the power of the state to say, hey, let's burn this person alive because he doesn't do what we tell him to do about religious things. So the book of Revelation, however, was written at a time when political and religious powers were combined. And um, that creates a really powerful beast that can really make life miserable for you. So the theme here is trust Jesus only. Don't trust anything else. Just trust Jesus. You can't trust politicians. You can't trust religious leaders. You can only trust Jesus. He is Lord. And a further thing, Jesus is coming back. So even though it looks like it's not going to happen, even though it looks like it's going to be delayed, hang in there. Be, and don't grow discouraged because Jesus is going to come back and he's going to put things right. I want to take a look at uh, uh, the beginning and the end of Revelation. Here's uh, the beginning, Revelation chapter 1. This is the prologue. This is a revelation. Some people use the Greek word apocalypse, for which means the same thing, a revelation, an unveiling, a, a revealing. This is a Revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him, Jesus, to show his servants the events that must soon take place. He, Jesus, sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant John. Notice the chain here, from God to Jesus to an angel to John, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is his report of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church. Notice it was not envisioned that every individual was going to have his own Bible. They're going to go to church and hear the Bible read aloud because not everybody had one. And he, God, blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says, for the time is near. Now again, remember, John wrote this towards the close of the first century. He says the time is near. Well, what was the time that was near. Well, the time of persecution, the time when you can't trust the religious or the political powers, you know, the time when you're going to have to hang on to Jesus. Of course, you know, there's a sense in which, since none of us ever lives very long, the time of our personal end is always near. But clearly, John also believed that the time when Jesus would return was going to be near. And people have said, well, what do you mean by near? I mean, you know, it's been like... Uh, 2,000 years since then, and, and he still isn't here, uh, John would say in answer to that, I don't care how long it's been, uh, keep uh, believing that the time is near. And even if it is another 1,000 years, I mean, your time here is very short. You're only going to be here for 60, 70, 80 years, so do something with it now. Now let's jump to Revelation 21, which is, of course, the next to the last chapter in the book of Revelation. And here John is describing his vision in which he sees a new heaven and a new earth. The old heaven and the old earth, the one that was created back there in Genesis 1 when God said, let us make man in our image and all that, that's disappeared. And the sea was also gone. And John sees this new heaven and a new earth. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem. So Jerusalem's gone. Now there's a new Jerusalem. Coming down from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And this is a picture of a wedding feast about to take place. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people, just like it was back long ago. He will live with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. So here in Revelation 21, you clearly have a picture of a restoration taking place. 
And it continues in chapter 22. Uh, the angel showed me a river with a water of life. Well, there's a river running through Eden, remember, back there in Genesis. It flowed down the center of the main street, and on each side of the river grew a tree of life. You know, there was a tree of life back there in Genesis, too. In fact, God said when Adam and Eve sinned, we're going to have to bar them from the garden, lest they take the fruit of the tree of life and live forever. But now here the tree of life is back again, and it's available to human beings again for the first time since the fall. And, and notice the whole idea here is that there is a restoration, a new beginning. Jesus says, I am coming. I'm coming quickly. The time is short. This is going to happen. I'm going to make all things new. I'm going to put it all back together again. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. What you get out of this is the idea that Genesis and Revelation are like bookends to the Bible. Genesis describes the creation. Revelation describes the recreation. Genesis describes the fall. Revelation describes the restoration of everything that God originally intended human beings would know that they lost in the fall as a result of making bad choices. And now all of this is being put back together again, and people who are willing to enter into it will enter into it. In Genesis, you had the tree of life. In Revelation, the tree of life reestablished. In Genesis, you had immortality. God created human beings to live forever as long as they would live in connection with him, the source of all life. When they broke that connection, then they lost immortality and they began to die. But in Revelation, it's restored. So you see how um, Revelation is the fulfillment of everything that was prophesied way back there when human beings first went astray and lost all of that. And the message again is very clear. Hang in there. Don't be discouraged. Terrible things are going to happen to you and to your loved ones and to the world, but don't be discouraged because just as there was a beginning, there will be an end. And the end will be like the beginning in that it will establish God's original purpose for human beings and for the earth and for the universe.